The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. I'm so grateful for Beatrice and Elliot pouring the waters today, reminding us that wherever we come from, wherever we go, God has called us here to this place and will make of us one people. So welcome to worship this Lord's Day when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from death into life. You can let us know about the gift of your presence by scanning the QR code at the top of page two in the bulletin or using the Realm Connect app. And we're grateful that of all the places you could be this morning, you are here among God's people to worship. And those watching online, we're grateful that you are worshiping with us as well. There's a lot of information in the bulletin on page seven. I don't need to tell you about the egg hunt, which took place at 1015. However, the landscapers found an egg or two from last year's hunt <laughs> a few days ago. So there may be still some time for you after the service, but thank you to all of our children's leaders and the, the volunteers that made that possible today. You'll see also um, out front on the Main Street entrance, if you didn't come in that way, I encourage you to, to exit that way today. There is the cross that you're invited to help um, for the flowering of the cross. Flowers are available. It's a great place to take a family photo. It's also a wonderful place to engage with one another as we, as a community, celebrate the risen Christ in our midst. Again, we are so glad that you are here today. Let us worship God.
I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in our call to worship printed in your bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia.
Please be seated. When Jesus cried, it is finished, all of scripture had been fulfilled and the sin debt for all people was paid in full. It was then that the temple curtain tore in two and creation had complete access to the presence of God. The empty tomb is Jesus' victory over death and sin that separated us. The old covenant was gone, the new was ushered in, and God is glorified. When we confess our belief in Christ as Savior, the veil of spiritual blindness is lifted by God's grace and compassion. Knowing our Redeemer lives, we go together before the Lord with our unison prayer of confession, saying, Merciful God, we are slow to trust the good news of Easter. So many things threaten silence our allegiance. The belief that nothing will ever change, the fear that hope is a lie, the cynicism that whispers you are foolish to believe the Easter story changes anything. Forgive us. Silence any voice which seeks convince us you have no power. Remind us that you are the God of Easter. Tear down the walls of death. Break open the doors of life. Help us to believe your life-giving power is a reason to hope. And may the promise of resurrection fill us with hope. Please continue your prayers in silence. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Surely Jesus is the Son of God. God swallowed up death. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Jesus Christ. At this time, I invite you to sing with me as we welcome the children forward for Children of the Chancel, and we're going to sit on the floor in front of the communion table today. Happy Easter! I am so excited that today is Easter. We have been waiting and preparing for this day for the past six weeks. Do you all remember what time it is we've been um, in the past six weeks getting ready for Easter? What do we call that in the church year? What is it? Lent. Lent, that's right. And what color is Lent? What color is it? It is purple, that's right. And so we've been spending our time trying to focus on Jesus, reflecting and praying and, and figuring out how Jesus wants us to follow him and how we should do that in our lives. And at the beginning of Lent, we all came together and we did something for Lent because we usually, everybody gives something up. Sometimes we take on a new practice, maybe we pray more often or we do something nice for others during Lent, and sometimes we give things up, and we put something away together in my purple box. Does anybody remember what we put away for Lent? <gasps> what is it, Hudson? The Alleluias. That's right. We put away our Alleluias so that we could focus and reflect, and they would be very, very special when we got them back out again, right? And so today is Easter, when we get to find out, what did we find out on Easter? What is it that we celebrate? What is it, Anthony? 
that Jesus rose from the dead. That's right, that God made Jesus alive again. The women went to the tomb, and they didn't know what was going to happen. They were going to go visit Jesus' body at the tomb. And when they got there, there was an angel. And what did the angel say? The thing that angels always say. What did the angel say? Go ahead, both of you. What did they say? Do you know? Jesus is not here. That's right. What's the first thing the angel says? They always say, don't be afraid. Because angels always start with, don't be afraid. I've got some good news to tell you. And then he said, Jesus is not here. And the women were surprised and excited and ran to tell the other disciples. And so they were so excited that they needed to share that news, right? So let's see if we're ready. Are you all ready to get the alleluias back out? Okay, good, because then maybe we can share our alleluias too. All right, here we go. Ah, Here's the banner that we put away. All right, what does that say? Alleluia. Alleluia. Aubrey, can you lay that on the communion table for me so that everybody can see the Alleluia? All right, and if anybody remembers, we put away a lot of our music because a lot of our songs have Alleluia in them. Hudson, will you put that on the communion table? All right. Would you like to put one over here on this side on the communion table? Ooh, these are my rocks, too. Do you remember my rocks from my office? We made these during um, COVID in one of our Sunday school classes on Zoom. So we need to put those on the communion table. You want to put one on there, Max? Do you want to put one on there, Lydia? All right, let's see who else. Would you like to put one on there, Naomi? Would you like to put one up there? Okay, they need to all be together so they can spell out Alleluia. Good. And we had some pieces of paper that said Alleluia. You want to put that on there? But it looks like all this time that we've been waiting, my Alleluias have Grown. These weren't in the box before. So now that we've waited and waited, they have grown, and we now can share them. I can share them with you, and you can share them with other people. So, Isabel and William, will you go give those to someone in the congregation so we can share? Hallelujah. You want to share one with someone in the congregation? Gregory, you want to go share one? There's someone sitting right behind you. Share the alleluia. And Blair, would you like to share one? How about you, Hudson? can be with anybody. Lydia, you want to go share one with someone in the congregation? Max, you may go share one. Absolutely. All right, good. I like it. Share them. we got plenty. We can give them out. We can share them with everyone. You want to share one, Charlotte? Okay, good. Anybody else? You want to share one? All right, there you go. Okay, good. Go give them to somebody in the congregation so we can share the alleluias. You want to share one? Okay, good. Do you want to share one? Okay. No? Yeah. Good job. Good job. Now, do we just share our alleluias with everybody here in the church? We're so excited that God made Jesus alive again, and we can say alleluia. Praise God for that. We don't have to just share our alleluias here with the congregation. We can share that good news with everybody outside the church, too, right? We can let them know that God made Jesus alive again, and we're so excited. And we can sing and pray and share those alleluias with other people. Thank you for sharing that, Max. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Let's. What about the tulips? They're beautiful, aren't they? Yeah, they're lovely. Um, Yes, if people give them and they want to take one home at the end of the service, they can. That's a good question. That's a good question. But the deacons are taking some home, too, so to people who are uh, shut-ins. All right, so before we go upstairs to wow, let us all pray together. I invite the congregation to pray with us, too, and repeat after me. Loving God, thank you for making Jesus alive again. Thank you for your forgiveness forgiveness. and the promise promise of eternal life life with you. you. Gratefully, we say, say, we sing sing, and we shout, shout, Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. Miss Jamie's going to go to the door, and you all can line up with her. If it's your child's first time to come up, you're welcome to come see where we are, give us some contact information, and then come back down to the service.
Let us pray. Living God, roll away any stone which blocks our hearing of your word. By your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see the new light of this day. Open our hearts to believe the good news. Open our lips to tell the world what God has done. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Let's hear, hear now these words from the Gospel of Mark. And as we listen today, let's listen together for the word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they had been saying to one another along the way, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of them to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, have you ever invested yourself in a story, maybe a novel, or even a whole television series that left you feeling annoyed at the end because the story didn't resolve the way you wanted it to or even resolve at all? You sat there, the book closed on your lap before you, or you sat staring as the credits rolled across your television, and you watch in disbelief. You think to yourself, how could they stop the story there? Why would they leave so many unanswered questions? If you've had that happen, then you probably understand why there's a whole episode from the Big Bang Theory devoted to closure. You don't have to know the show or its characters for that episode's plot line to make sense. But I should tell you that Dr. Sheldon Cooper, one of the main characters, is a theoretical physicist who is uh, marked by his quirkiness, which is a nice way of saying, um, kind of a kind way of saying, he was compulsive. He liked things to be decent and in order. Well, in the episode called The Closure Alternative, Sheldon discovers that one of his favorite television series has been canceled. They can't cancel it, he cried. It ended on a cliffhanger. I have to know what happened. Enter Sheldon's equally quirky girlfriend, Amy Farrah Fowler, a new neuroscientist who studies the human brain. She tells Sheldon that she can help him overcome his compulsive desire for closure by putting him through a series of exercises in which he is asked to do a number of simple things, none of them with resolution. They sing the national anthem, but she stops him just before that closing line and the home of the brave. She has him set up a long line of dominoes, a whole box full, but then she makes him put them back in the box before he can tip over the first one and watch it cascade to completion. She lights birthday candles on a cake. Now blow them out, she says. 
But then she takes a paper plate and blocks the last one so it stays lit. To which she says, now you won't get your wish. Good thing for you, he seethed, I wished you were dead, right? <laughs> Lack of closure can drive you to desperation. All of that anticipation without any resolution drove Sheldon to the height of exasperation, which is why I can say with absolute certainty, Sheldon Cooper would hate, hate Mark's Easter story. And I suspect he would be in good company. There is no closure in Mark's story. It just ends. After all of the time in Mark's gospel, where Jesus is shown heading toward Jerusalem and to the cross, all throughout Mark, he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem, all the way detailing, they finally get there and Mark doesn't seem to know what to do. Mark gives us 119 verses detailing the suffering and the death of Jesus. But you heard, he gives us only eight verses of resurrection. And they are slim at best. That's why some will read Mark's gospel faithfully to the end and come away feeling cheated by its abrupt and unresolved ending. You know this, all of the other gospels, Matthew, Luke, John, they all give us more details. In each of them, we get to hear from Jesus himself. We eat breakfast with Jesus by the seashore. We watch Jesus walk right through locked doors. We hear Jesus say to us, peace be with you. We listen to Jesus give the church its instructions. You remember in Matthew, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. All of those other gospels have neat beginnings and tidy conclusions. They all, of course, say that Jesus died, but they shout the news in every voice that they can that Jesus rose from the dead. But not Mark. Not Mark. He, he simply describes the women walking toward the tomb. They're going to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. We hear the voice of the man dressed in the white robe proclaim the news. He's not here. He's been raised, just like he said. But tell the disciples to go and tell them he'll meet them in Galilee. There is the promise of where the risen Jesus will show up, but Mark's gospel ends before he does so. There is no presence of Jesus to comfort and renew and heal our commission with the last blessing of the church. So what are we to make of a gospel ending on such a note? What could we possibly say about a gospel that ends with this? So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. As one preacher famously said of Mark's Easter story, this is no way to run a resurrection. Well, a few days ago, a mother from our congregation posted some video of her three-year-old daughter's school Easter egg hunt. You can picture the scene. Some of you may have seen something like it a moment ago. At that age, you never know what is going to happen. And the video unfolded with some of that um, typical searching scene. But what made this video so intriguing to me was that Hudson, Lydia's six-year-old brother, who in the video is standing outside of the playground. He's leaning against the chain link fence, jumping up and down with great excitement, shouting words of encouragement to his sister. Over here, he cries. 
there's one right here. Come over here. Um, and that encouragement soon gave way to exasperation because whether Lydia heard his cries or not maybe is up for debate, but she kept missing that gray, green egg that he wanted her to pick up. It's right here. It's right in front of you, he kept saying, right there. If you want a picture of exasperation, there it was. Well, in my imagination, I can picture the other gospel writers leaning over Mark's shoulder as he writes. And they're shouting to him with exasperated cries like Hudson, the risen Lord is right here. Look, right in front of you. Look, look. Their accounts um, show what they've seen. The risen Lord everywhere in theirs. But if Mark hears their cries, in my imagination, Mark surely does not listen. So what do we do with an Easter account where Jesus doesn't even bother to show up? Well, now, if you look in your Bibles, you'll likely see a couple of additions to the story. The church has been troubled by Mark's ending since the very beginning. If you look in your Bible, you'll likely see a couple of tacked on endings. One is known as the shorter ending. One, the longer ending is a, a great original titles. Well, here's how um, the church said, you know, if Mark's not going to resolve this story, we need to do it for him. And so the church added this. Remember, they left the tomb, fear and terror had seized them, so they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, end. And the church added this, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent them, sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. And they added even, amen. Now it's ended, they said. But does that sound like Mark at all? You know, it sounds to me like something that uh, chat GPT would spit out, which makes me think AI has been around a little longer than we might think. You know, as Mark tells it, the women fled from the tomb for fear and amazement had overtaken them. And they said nothing to anyone. For they were afraid. What are we to say in the face of that silence? We could say this. The women fled in fear and said nothing to anyone because they didn't understand what had happened. They didn't understand what the resurrection meant. The experience was so shocking and so new, so overwhelming that it was simply more than they could handle. In other words, we could say the women were afraid because they didn't understand the resurrection at all. And there's a possibility, maybe even a strong possibility, that if we told that story, we would be right. After all, it's impossible for us, any of us, to understand the resurrection. But there is another possibility, another side to the story. As I once heard someone say, it's an awfully thin board that doesn't have two sides. So we could say something else. We could just as easily say it like, the, like this, the women were afraid not because they didn't understand the resurrection, but because they did. What if what if terror and amazement seized the women, not because they didn't know what resurrection meant, but because they sensed in the very center of themselves that the world would never be the same. They knew that God had done more than roll away the stone. In the resurrection, God had rolled away all that is false about the world, throwing open a curtain to reveal life as it's meant to be. No wonder they were afraid. They knew that resurrection changed everything. 
And for us to consider that these women may have been afraid because they sensed the world would never be the same cuts right to the center of our lives, forces us to, to answer, to decide if we believe, really believe, that the God who raised Jesus from death to life can do so for us and for all the world and make real the kingdom whose fullness we await. To say we understand even a part of the resurrection is to force us to challenge the countless stones we think will never be removed. Stones piled up by our own sinfulness, perhaps, or just by the sense of life. Stones we've grown accustomed to forces us, if we trust the resurrection, to move beyond our indifference, to stop thinking that what we do doesn't matter, to stop believing that nothing is ever going to change in the church, in our families, in ourselves, or the world. In fact, it forces us to believe that resurrection changes everything, even us. And no matter what the circumstances of life suggest, it forces us to recognize that God's purpose will win out. Love is going to be proven stronger than hate. Despair is not going to stand a chance against hope. And life, no matter what we may be tempted to believe, Life is always more powerful than death. Now there was a, a youth in my first church out of seminary who was an amazingly talented pianist and songwriter. He was one of those um, kids that could put all the notes in the right places, play them with passion, but he also grasped the theological possibilities in what he wrote. And I'm thinking now of a song he wrote for the piano as a postlude that he played at a worship service for the General Assembly one year. I remember he came to my house when he had finished writing it, and when he played it for me, um, I remember his excitement, and at the very last note as it sounded and died away, I remember him asking, did you hear that? Did you hear it asking you to finish the song, to sound the next note? For he had written it in a way that seemed to be calling for yet more. Which is sort of what Mark does with his gospel, the end of his gospel. He sounds his final note, but you can hear the gospel begging for more. Mark tells us the resolution to my story comes from what you do next. Mark beckons us beyond the silence. The risen Lord is on the far side of the silence where we, like Hudson did for his sister, point with all the exuberance we can muster to the places we see God at work in this world, making all things new. Can't you see us out there full-bodied, pointing, there is God at work, right there, making all things new. Don't you see it? And we offer that invitation, just, just an invitation, just inviting others to see to notice and to follow the risen Lord who is out there calling each of us by name. Well, let me invite you now to stand with me as together we say what we believe. Jesus is our living Lord. Jesus was dead and buried, but God raised him from the dead. We declare that Jesus is Lord. His resurrection is a decisive victory over the powers that deform and destroy human life. His Lordship is hidden. The world appears to be dominated by people and systems 
that do not acknowledge his rule. But his lordship is real. It demands our loyalty and sets us free from the fear of all lesser lords who threaten us. We maintain that ultimate sovereignty now belongs to Jesus Christ in every sphere of life. Jesus is Lord. He has been Lord from the beginning. He will be Lord at the end. Even now, he is Lord. be seated. Imagine, imagine everything being made new. Imagine something that changes everything. That's what gathers us. That's the story we tell of a God who loves so much that it's beyond any love we know. And so when we speak with and to that God, when we pray, we pray not only for our own needs and concerns and celebrations, but for those of all whom God loves, and that is everyone. Please join me now in a spirit of prayer. God of ceaseless new beginnings, we rejoice that through your powerful love, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. In the resurrection, you have shown that neither trouble nor persecution, hardship nor poverty, danger nor death can separate us from your love. Free us to trust in you that we may live in the confidence of your children. In the resurrection, you were victorious over sin, violence, and oppression. Free us to risk ourselves in the struggle for justice and peace, that we may be your partners in restoring all creation to your will. In the resurrection, you have opened the gates of eternal life, 
Free us from the fear of death, that we may serve you with courage. In the resurrection, you bring new possibilities out of hopeless situations. Free us from all despair, that we may bring your hope to those who have lost heart. Through the presence of Jesus Christ among us, draw us into a community of freedom, hope, and love. Work your new creation among us, that we may serve you without fear. God most holy, God most loving, God most knowing, we praise your name forever. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. All right, I'm going to try a little experiment. Here we go. Christ the Lord is risen today. Y'all a bunch of Sheldons. <laughs> Me too. But you have just voiced what John spoke about in relation to the Gospel of Mark. That the resolution of the story comes from what we do next. And what we did next was resound the Alleluia. That's not only the celebration of this day, it's also the call to resound the Alleluia in how we live and what we say and do. We reflect that in the choices we make, including the choices about how we give and where. Today, you can give through plates by the doors here or online or you can give during the week through the office. But however you do it, let the Alleluia resound.
please join me in a spirit of prayer. Holy God, giver of life and conqueror of death, we give you thanks that you have blessed us, that we might be a blessing, that the alleluia that echoes in this space may resound in all the world. Through us and our faithfulness, may the prayer be answered that Jesus taught when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Surely as you have made this place ring with your resounding hallelujahs, we go into a world that is teeming with resurrection and with life. There's so much goodness and beauty and grace in the world. And our joyful task is to go and point to all of the places where we see God at work. Right here. Join. So go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord, do so with joy. And may God's grace rest upon you now and evermore. Amen. Amen.